Sai Ram. You're listening to Sai Soul 100, a weekly podcast series with soul, or stories of unconditional love, shared by devotees of Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba in celebration of his 100th birthday. We invite you to listen in on these motivational stories of his constant loving presence in devotees' lives. Offered at his lotus feet by the Sri Satya Sai International Organization USA, Mid Atlantic Region. Welcome to Sai Soul 100. Sai Ram, dear listeners, welcome to Sai Soul 100. Our guest today is Sister Satya Ramavataram, or Satyanti, as we will lovingly call her today. She's joining us from Rochester, New York. Satyanti has been a devotee of Swami since 1994, when she was 60 years old. That visit has transformed her entire life. Today, we will hear this story and how Swami's hand has been guiding her ever since. Sairam Satyanti, welcome to Sai Soul 100. Sairam. Sairam, how are you doing today? Oh, not too bad, thanks. Looking forward to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You say that Swami is a sculptor and we are his finest works of art. Swami immediately started working on you since the first time you met him. Can you tell us about the first darshan you had of Swami? Yes. The first darshan I had of him was in 1994. In I think it was June or July, I don't remember. But I, I saw him in, in Brindavan, his ashram in Brindavan. I had no idea what ashram life is like or what darshan is all. But I had heard about it in my center in Norwalk. So I went, was anxious to go there. When I got into ashram, uh, one lady took me, a volunteer lady took me and told me where to sit. And I just sat there. And it was almost time for Swami to come. I think I didn't know that. But I heard some beautiful music. And I said, maybe they're going to start, start the bhajans. But before I knew, he, there he was coming from his quarters into the darshan hall. And first thing he did was to go and spend a lot of time with all the disabled and sick people who were sitting all on, in a row. He went one by one talking to each one of them. With so much compassion and so much love. Then I said, this is how probably Jesus used to heal the people. Mm -hmm. And then went around the audience and he was about, about 20 or 40 feet from where I was, far away. He had collected a lot of letters from devotees and he was talking to one lady <laughs> on the front row, right in very beginning front of the hall. And I had a good darshan and I thanked him for that. And then in people from my center had given me some letters to, to give to Baba. And I said to myself, he's not going to come this far to pick up the letters. The moment I had that thought, he was almost five feet from where I was, standing almost next to me. And I handed him the letters and he came and stood next to me. And I remember touching his right foot and doing Pad Namaskar. After that, I was in a deep state of deep sleep. I didn't know what it was. I had no where I was, what was happening. I was totally lost to the world. And I don't know how long this uh, continued. But when I opened my eyes, I realized that my head was in his, on his robe. Mm. And he knew exactly when I woke up from that state. He pulled this his rope gently away and walked around the square in which we were sitting. And as he passed by me, I saw that his feet were not touching the ground. Wow. He was a couple of inches above the ground. And he then I didn't let him go out of my sight. I was watching every move of his. And then I saw him walking around and people were putting little babies on his feet and he would bless them. And people were giving, handing him some slates. Children were handing him some slates and 
he would write home on that. I saw, I was observing all that. And I didn't let him go out of my sight. I was watching every move that he was making. So he walked around the, to the Darshan Hall for a few minutes. And then he went up the dais. At that point, he was completely hidden by a pillar. And I couldn't see him clearly. So then as he came out of that, moved from there and came to the center of the dais, he had his back to us, to the audience. And I saw this bright blue light around his head. Then he turned around and his face was glowing like the moon. Bright, very bright. And he blessed the crowd and left the room. As he left the room, I felt like Jesus was leaving the room. I really don't know why I thought of that, but that's what came into my mind. Mm. And after the session, people sort of get up and start talking and, and run, children's running here and there and all the time was happening. And my sister said to me, she said, you know, he was standing next to you so long, but he never produced Vibhuti. And I said, I'm not going to complain. I, I'm very happy. And we left the hall and we went to collect our shoes. And there was a couple from my Snorlock Center who were there. I didn't know they had they would be there, but they were there. And they said, oh, Satya, you're so lucky you got Pad Namaskar on the very first visit. And I didn't even know the word Pad Namaskar at that time. So it, I was surprised that I had done something without knowing what the meaning of it was. And then uh, I went, this was in Prindavan, which is near Bangalore city. So I, I was staying in Bangalore. So I went to went back to the taxi that I had hired to get back to Bangalore. It was then when I was sitting in the taxi that it hit me, this intense feeling of joy and happiness and love for everything around me. My whole body was shaking. My heart was thump, thump, thump. It was completely very, very difficult physical reaction. I couldn't take the reaction. Uh, and so I prayed to him and I said, please Swami, whatever this was, let this feeling come down. And it came to a point where I could enjoy it without the physical discomfort. And the taxi driver asked me, where, do you, where can I take you? Is there anywhere else you want to go? So I said, I'd like to go to a bookshop. So he took me to a bookshop in Bangalore and I just was looking around and the first thing that caught my attention was the Taitriya Upanishad. Mm. I didn't even know the word Upanishad at that time. I, did, I didn't even know there was a scripture by that name. Anyway, I picked that book, opened it, and it was all in Sanskrit, English subtitles. So I said, okay, I can read translation. It was such a complicated book that it took me nine years to understand the message of the book was. And, to, and that helped me to understand the experience that I had with Swami and what it, what it really meant. It was a life transforming experience, which expressed itself as bliss. But this Upanishad explained to me exactly what Swami had done in that moment. Wow. When you said the first thing you asked when the driver said, where do you want to go? You said to a bookshop. I always, I think that's so telling of your uh, background because that would not be the first place that I would want to go if I was shaking. But I think that that has led you, like you said, um, you know, has changed the trajectory of your spiritual journey and your life. You said that you had this feeling of just the highest level of consciousness and joy. Yes. Um, the bookshop is just the first part of that journey. How has that moment directed the rest of your spiritual journey with that blessing? Yes. Um, the the I think what Swami did was he told he showed me the end end of the spiritual journey. So mm. that experience is the goal. What I was supposed to do is the is the effort to reach that goal on my own. It's like you go and teacher tells you what the, what the subject is about and you have to make the effort to understand the subject. Right. 
see so this was like the goal of the journey is to experience that bliss of existence mm. he he chooses how what type of journey is suitable for a given person so i think this is what i learned from that experience that each one of us has a unique way in which he guides us towards that goal wow and uh, you know i think that for you that expression um and the goal has been this lifelong learning of the Upanishads and um you know the Sanskrit literature at large all kind of defining that moment helping you understand that moment in your first birth yes, exactly right? yes, be- because yeah. before that my attitude towards edu- to towards spirituality was very uh, mundane in the sense you think that god is in the temple and you are just go and pray there and come back but he showed me the depth of what a spiritual effort should be and what the spiritual journey is about and i know you have a very unique expression of this knowledge that you have gained um in this journey through the mandalas do you mind if you could share just really quickly how the mandala journey started the mandala for me the way he taught me is that a sense of of whatever scripture that i i read is can be put in one one diagram that gives you the whole um, that sort of summarizes the text that i had read and that way i can share my understanding of the scriptures with others so that that's that's how he i think he inspired me to do the mandalas for example um after the taitreya upanishad there was, i i made a drawing out of that a mandala but the for example the chandas chandogya upanishad there is a beautiful description of selfless service and what is what the result of selfless service is this is called the doctrine of honey and the the sage who who was teaching his student gives this example of the bee the bees how they mm-hmm. collect honey uh, the juice from a, the essence of a flower convert it into honey in their digestive system and then they deposit it in the eye but they themselves do not enjoy the honey the honey is enjoyed by someone else who comes by the by and gets the honey so mm. the idea is that in selfless service that we do creates a novel force in the universe mm. and that novel force is deposited in the sun and it is returned to the universe when and where it is required so if i do some self service i am not the one who is going to benefit from it that self service will produce a positive energy that will be released when and where it is required when we do selfless service as swami says it should be done in an unselfish way mm. so that if the benefit is going to someone who badly needs the that particular positive energy that we have created like swami says you know we're all like ants taking sugar away from him and you know just distributing that that is so beautiful to hear that the analogy of using you know the sun and the bees it has been so inspiring on to to hear how swami came into your life infused his energy which has led you down this higher path of knowledge and i think that knowing that your career as a nuclear scientist that is so fulfilling i'm sure and i think above all to your point on self the service his divine hand is giving you a way to share that knowledge with each and every one of us uh which you know further amplifies his blessing thank you satyanti for sharing your story yeah. thank you for listening to my story i'm happy to share it with all of you it has been such a pleasure and dear listeners swami at any point in time can call us to our higher purpose and charge us with the energy to get there. Look out for his blessing. I'm Sri Kodavari Ganti, and I would like to thank you for joining us on today's episode. Till next time, Jai Sarang.